Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to my channel, Runaway Slave. For those of you who don't know, this is the 2.0. This is where we're going to rock out in the meantime until I figure out what I want to do with the videos. But first, I like to say thanks to all my subs. Anybody who watches the videos, clicks like, comments, shares, anybody who has donated to the channel or purchased the masterpiece, the N word is no secret in the service. I appreciate you all. For more information, just look in the comment section. You'll see the pinned comment and you'll get all the information you need right there. And please do join the email list. Please, if you have already joined the email list, that means I already have your information. But if you have not joined the email list, please scroll down on that comment and click to join the email list. Anyway, let's cook. Okay, so we're going to discuss a true warrior by the name of Abu Badika Sonny Carson. Now, many of us know that name, Sonny Carson, from the legendary movie, The Education of Sonny Carson. That movie was based off a book that Abu Badika Sonny Carson wrote. But the real Sonny Carson in real life was actually a thousand times bigger than the movie. He was actually one of the most feared black men in America at one point. He was even so feared that he ran John Gotti out of bed style Brooklyn. He was a powerful civil rights leader. He was an activist, a warrior, a organizer, and he was really many more things, people. But one thing that he wasn't is he was not scared. He wasn't scared of the state of New York. He wasn't scared of the NYPD, the mayor, the district attorney, or the Department of Education. Now, Sonny Carson's way of doing things was different than a lot of other civil rights leaders, but he did things the way that he felt as though it would be effective and it would produce results, okay? He was somebody who was for his people in every way, and he also believed in by any means necessary. And yes, he too was a disciple of Imam El Hajj Malik Sabaz Malcolm X, okay? He was all about that by any means necessary. Now, a little bit more about Sonny Carson's background. Abu Badika Sonny Carson was born as Robert Carson Jr. on May 22, 1936 in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Like many people from the South, his family eventually moved north to escape, you know, some things, look for more job opportunities and also to get away from some of the harsh Jim Crow and segregation in the South. So like many families, they moved north. OK, now when he moved up north to New York, he went about his life in Brooklyn, New York as a child. And as he got older, he became a teenager. He always had the warrior spirit. He always was a leader leader. Now, before Sonny Carson even, you know, became a teenager, y'all, he already started getting involved in crime. In elementary school, he was already, you know, stealing from newsstands. After that, he eventually joined a street gang called the Bishops. So he's in his gang called the Bishops. And by junior high school, Sonny Carson was already an accomplished mugger. OK, he was a, an accomplished stick up kid. He was constantly high on drugs and at a young age, he realized and he was very firm in his belief that the only important quality, human quality that was needed was remorseless aggression. OK, that's the way he's seen things. Now, being that he was young, running around with this gang, the bishops and doing his street thing, this eventually led to him being arrested for robbing a Western Union messenger. OK, now after this, he was caught. And he was sent to a state run juvenile detention center. OK, now, when when Sonny Carson was at this state run juvenile detention center, he was known as one of the toughest boys in the facility. And he was always prepared to fight. He was always prepared to defy the parole board and do and say whatever he wanted. He was a very tough kid amongst tough people. OK, he was that standout. Upon being released from the juvenile prison, Sonny Carson joined the military. And when he joined the military, he served in the Korean War. He was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. When Sonny Carson was at war, he claimed that he met a Korean soldier who asked him, why would a black man fight for a country that would not let you drink from the same water fountain in Mississippi? Now, after this Korean soldier asked Sonny Carson this question, it really stuck in his head and it really triggered something. And... After he left the military, due to that question, he decided that he was going to become a community activist when he went home. OK, so 
after the war, Sonny Carson goes home and he enrolled in college. The first thing he did that was enroll in college. Now, he still had this thing in mind, this question that this Korean soldier asked him. OK, but he enrolled in college. But you got to remember, Sonny Carson is still young and he's still not done with the streets completely. He's not done. He jumped into the life of a Brooklyn hustler after the military while he's enrolled in school. He's selling drugs. He's running an illegal gambling spot. But all this time that he's doing these things, he knew that he was supposed to do something bigger and he was supposed to dedicate his life to his people. And he was definitely leaning towards radical power politics. Now, when Sonny Carson felt as though that he was going to get involved in activism, he knew that there was no way that he was going to be a black moderate. You can tell from how Sonny Carson was before all the energy that he had, the type of person that he was, an aggressive individual. You just knew that all he would do or all he had to do was transfer that energy that he had into doing something positive for his people. And that's what he did. It only made sense to Sonny Carson to become a defiant black nationalist. Sonny Carson once wrote. There was another brother looking back on 1964 named Martin Luther King. He was beginning to upset me because that philosophy that he was spreading and it didn't seem to fit right with me. That turned the other cheek business. Shit. Malcolm, I think, was saying it right. That if someone hit you on one side of your cheek, you lay him in the grave. So you already know people what kind of person or what kind of politics or ideology Sonny Carson was going to follow, okay? Now, on Sonny Carson's journey towards activism and trying to advance the status of his people, he started to work for an organization called Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE. So, people, CORE is one of those organizations that claim to be for the advancement of uh, black people at this time. And they said that CORE was an African-American civil rights organization in the United States that played a pivotal role for African-Americans in the civil rights movement. It was founded in 1942. And this is his mission statement, people. The mission statement for CORE is to bring about equality for all people, regardless of race, creed, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, religion, or ethnic background. So by now, people, with that mission statement, we can see the red flag. I know hindsight is 2020, but now we know the red flag. And we know this due to people like Sonny Carson and others who have put in the work, been through these things, seen it, done it. OK, we know that mission statement is something wrong. We know that this is a white supremacist liberal organization. We know this. their bottom line. OK, their bottom line. So we can thank people like Sonny Carson for this. Anytime we see an organization that says that their mission statement is to bring about equality for all people, regardless of race, creed, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, religion, or ethnic background, we know that these organizations aren't for us. That doesn't mean that we don't want everybody to have these things for them, but all of these other ethnic groups already have these things within their groups. Whenever black people in America want to have something like that, it has to be this whole rainbow thing for everybody. But the Irish have their own groups, the Koreans have their own groups, the Polish, the Jewish, the Italians, the Filipino, everybody in America has their own groups for them, period. OK, now this other whole rainbow type stuff, they like to group this with anything that black people are trying to do to advance. And that's that in itself is a white supremacist ideology or a white supremacist action. Thankful to people like Sonny Carson and others, you know, they, they figured these things out years ago. And we got to definitely respect that. OK, now. This group called CORE that Sonny Carson was with, it was a real big deal at that time. Like, this was a real big deal, y'all. CORE was a big deal. Now, of course, he joined the group for one thing. One thing that this, uh, this CORE group was they were inspired by an Indian nationalist by the name of Mahatma Gandhi for their nonviolent tactics. Now, we all know that Mahatma Gandhi, by now, he hated black people, okay? And this was something that a lot of our people at that time didn't know. So we know that somebody like Sonny Carson with this nonviolent stuff, he's not going to last. But he did rise up through the ranks in this core organization. And by the year of 1967, Sonny Carson was the executive director of the Brooklyn Corps. Okay. 
Now, by this time, Sonny Carson was realizing that this group core didn't have his people's best interests at heart. He's figuring this out. So he decided to do things a little bit different. So, you know, Sonny Carson is going to do it his way anyway, regardless if he's in his core group or not. So he started to have the young black youths who had issues in the hood in Brooklyn, New York, come to his office, talk, do different things, have meetings and things like that. You know, it was starting to look different. Sonny Carson, he picked up on the okie doke of this core group and he decided he was going to do what he wanted to do. Now, he had enough of core. And by the year 1968, he left and he stated that this group didn't do enough to help African-Americans. So after that, Sonny Carson, he formed his own group called Committee to Honor Black Heroes. And this Committee to Honor Black Heroes that he started, their headquarters was in the basement of a downtown Brooklyn building. If you ever went to his headquarters, you would see the front door manned by two young black men or by black young men, young black men standing at the front door. If you went into the office, you would see rooms that were decorated with African images, posters of Malcolm X and rare African artifacts throughout the office. In the hallways where you would see dozens of, uh, you know, young black men lounging in the hallways or sitting along the wall. And if you ever went into Sonny Carson's actual office, there would be more black youths in there as well. So that's how Sonny Carson wanted to do it. Now, Sonny Carson, in his new organization that he formed, he said that he was opposed to integration and he thought that mingling with whites could only be humiliating. He felt that the black middle class were perpetrators of integration and traitors to their race. And by now, with his new organization and the things that he was out in the community doing, Sonny Carson was starting to get the attention of the media. The media gravitated towards Sonny Carson because he was outspoken. He said what he wanted to say and he meant what he said. He had a no nonsense approach to standing up for black people in his community, primarily the youth. So due to this community activism that Sonny Carson was doing, he eventually caught the eye of Bobby Kennedy. Now, Bobby Kennedy, he was working with some big time, rich, deep pocket white folks that had a lot of money. And they had a group that was called the Bedford Stuyvesant Development Corporation. Now, this organization, this was a self-help effort that was supposed to absorb hundreds of millions of dollars into backing from government and private groups like Ford and IBM. OK, so Bobby Kennedy, he seen the way Sonny Carson was moving in the streets. He seen that his people respected him and he wanted Sonny Carson to sit on the board for this group. Now, when Bobby Kennedy selected Sonny Carson for this he was questioned by many white folks asking him why he was flirting with local tough guys and local militants and why he would put somebody like Sonny Carson in this project. And Bobby Kennedy said, these are the people that we have to reach. Some people may not like it, but they are in the street and that's where the ball game is being played. And Sonny Carson was definitely in the streets. His people loved him. The youth loved and respected him. The city of New York, law enforcement, political figures of or whoever, they were scared of what Sonny Carson can do at the snap of a finger. They knew that Sonny Carson could, could turn violence on and off at any time. Bobby Kennedy knew that. Now, this is my idea. I believe that Bobby Kennedy, regardless of how he felt, I believe that he sat back as a, as a white man who could observe and figure things out. He knew that with all this money coming in, all these big time billionaire donors, he knew that he better had gotten Sonny Carson than that because if he didn't, and they seen all this new fly stuff and nice stuff going up in the area, Sonny Carson was going to get the goons and they were going to burn it down. They, he, he, could, he could get the people to burn it down. So I'm sure that he figured I better wet his beak. I better make sure Sonny Carson and his people are squared away if I think I'm going to do anything. Bobby Kennedy actually knew how to think if that's, you know, I think that's the reason why. Now, uh, Sonny Carson, when he went on, he often in the media, when he spoke, he often spoke of being a separatist. OK, he wanted to separate from white people. His organization bought farmland and they announced plans for a separatist black settlement. When Sonny Carson spoke, he often wore a multicolored dashiki. He had an afro. Sometimes he wore a kufi, you know, and he often spoke about how important it was for black people to arm themselves focus on self-defense, things like that. And when he spoke, he definitely got attention. Politicians, uh, the media, the white community in New York, wherever, 
they knew that Sonny Carson was just not some crazy nut speaking, and they knew that he said what he meant because he was intelligent, he was articulate, he was very well respected by his people, which is very important, and everybody took him seriously. He was never dismissed as a fool whatsoever. So let's get into some of the epic wars that Sonny Carson was involved in. Now, we know that Sonny Carson was very into advancing his people. Therefore, he was very vested in the youth. OK, and he was very concerned about how they were being educated in public school. Now, Sonny Carson, he was not a member of the Department of Education. He was not with the school board. But Sonny Carson just decided that he was going to look into the Brooklyn public schools specifically the Bed-Stuy section, public schools. After he decided that, he said that he was going to, he announced that he was going to evaluate 32 teachers in the public school. So Sonny Carson said, I'm going to evaluate 32 public school teachers. People, keep in mind, Sonny Carson is not part of the school board, nor is he with the Department of Education. After a few weeks of his evaluation of these 32 teachers, he declared that all of them except five were fired. When the media asked him why he decided to fire them, he said that they had shortcomings. They asked him, well, what were their shortcomings? He said, well, they were white. Sonny Carson told them that he could just fire a teacher or he could fire teachers. He was told that you just can't do that. Sonny Carson responded to a media reporter. If the school superintendent thinks that we're kidding, he better wait until September and see what happens when those when those teachers try to come back to our community. When Sonny Carson said that, nobody said anything. Nobody responded. The teachers union did not respond. Now, Sonny Carson took the battle to them even further. Him and a group of his, his, his men, they went to the teachers union and Manhattan headquarters. So they just went down there and walked in, stayed there, sat on the couches, using the phone, eating, talking, doing whatever, and they slept there overnight. They just walked in there and did what they wanted. They took it over. Yeah, they took over the teachers' union headquarters. Could you imagine that? They just walked in and took it over. Now, after they spent their time there and did what they wanted to do, they left. A few weeks later, Sonny Carson and his crew decided that they were going to go to the board central office at 110 Livingston Street in Brooklyn, Okay. So they was going to go to the central office in Brooklyn. After that, they went to the headquarters in Man Manhattan, the teachers union headquarters. Now they're going to go to the office in Brooklyn. But this time when they went there, they were met by the cops. The police were there. They were ahead of them. OK, so when the police were there, what happens next? Sonny Carson and his crew got into an all out nasty brawl with the police and it landed one police officer in the hospital with serious injury. This patrol man named John Clark, he was struck in the head with a three foot metal ashtray. And after they struck him in the head, smacked him in the head with this metal ashtray, they yelled, I hope you die. So people, could you imagine, this is why these people didn't really want problems with Sonny Carson. Most people, when they see the police, they're gonna go or say, okay, well, we'll, we'll stand here, we'll protest, we'll be nonviolent, we'll go come back another day. Not Sonny Carson. He was going to bring the fight and the war to the police, whoever. Could you imagine getting smacked in the head with one of them old metal ashtrays? And then after they smacked him in the head, he's laying there, brains leaking. They telling him, we hope you die. These are what kind of men Sonny Carson had around him who were very loyal. OK, he also kept the pressure on the school board after this fight, people. What Sonny Carson did was he invited a dude named Albert Shanker, a small hat. OK, Albert Shanker. He's the head of the teachers union. Sonny Carson invited him to a community meeting that he was having. OK, a little bit more about this guy, Albert Shanker. He was known as a hardcore white supremacist, hated black folks. So Sonny Carson invites Albert Shanker to a meeting. Albert Shanker decides he'll come there. He comes to the meeting. Now, when he got to this meeting, he was met with a surprise. He couldn't leave. He was heckled by the people and they prevented him from leaving. You know, Sonny Carson and his men. So Albert Shanker was at this meeting, scared to death, sweating, fearing for his life. He begged Sonny Carson to
to leave and call off his men at the door. Sonny Carson, after this encounter, he often laughed about it when he was asked. And Sonny Carson's words were, that great big hunky union chief, he was standing there looking blotchy with apparent fright. Sonny Carson didn't like this dude. This guy was a hardcore white supremacist, small hat, okay? So the school year is starting in September. Remember what Sonny Carson said. He said that these people better not show up for this job. He already fired them. So what Sonny Carson and his crew did was they went into the schools in Brooklyn, okay? They would see teachers in the hallways, and they would tell them things like, the Germans didn't do a good enough job with you Jews. You got to remember at this time, again, this guy, Albert Shanker, who is a small hat Jew, and he was the head of the school board. So at this time in these public schools in New York, New York you got to figure most of, the, of these teachers are Jews. So Sonny Carson and his men are in the school, walking through the halls, scaring them, you know, just really scaring them, doing what they wanted to do. Eventually, what happened is the police were called to restore order in these public schools. And because these people complained that Sonny Carson and his crew were coming through, doing what they wanted to do. And when they tried to uh, go into a, another school one day, the police decided that they were going to meet them there. Actually, Sonny Carson and his crew decided that they were going to stand in front of the school door and block it. OK, they were going to block this. Nobody's coming in. Nobody says you dudes. You people think that after I done fired you already, you think you still got a job. OK, so they said, OK, we're, we're going to stand here. Nobody's coming in. So the school board, they decided they're going to call the NYPD to es escort them in. Big problem. When they got there. When the police got there with members of the school board and other teachers, white people, Sonny Carson and his crew of 50 men are standing on the steps with police helmets on and battle fatigues ready to go. So they're in a standoff. Now, while they're in this standoff, there was some punches thrown. There was some fighting when these police tried to escort these teachers in there. Outcome, the teachers still didn't get what they wanted. But they were allowed to enter the building, but they can't teach. So Sonny Carson and the crew say you can come in, but you can't teach. After that, Sonny Carson and his crew made all the teachers report to an auditorium in another school. You all go there to meet. We got to talk to you. So all these teachers listen and they go to the other school. And when they get to the other school, Sonny Carson's followers are all lined up against the against the walls in the auditorium. They're carrying sticks and bandoliers of bullets. So imagine that these sweaty Jewish teachers coming into this school auditorium orders of Sonny Carson, another school. They get in there and there's a whole bunch of Sonny Carson soldiers standing there with sticks and bandoliers. They pushed all the teachers into the middle of the auditorium in the middle of the room. And while they pushed these teachers into the middle of the room, Sonny Carson and his crew began to yell at them. Say things like, wait till we get the lights out. We're going to throw lie in your face. You're going to be very visible then. You know, just saying what they wanted to. I mean, these teachers are scared. As all this is going on, there are lights. They're flicking the lights on and off in the hallways. As the teachers are pushed, they're shoved. They're told that the only way they're leaving this room is in a pine box. So Sonny Carson and his crew, they're here just terrorizing these teachers. They felt as though this is what needed to be done to get their point across. He already fired teachers and he meant it. Now, this episode against the Brooklyn Department of Education and Sonny Carson, it finally ended. You know, we don't know how it ended completely, but Sonny Carson definitely did get some things that he wanted. You got to figure a lot of these teachers said, I'm not dealing with this. And they would just leave and quit. Because he wasn't playing. It wasn't worth it. You know, what would make people not show up to work more than violence? OK. And it was all everything that Sonny Carson did was all for his people. He didn't want these people teaching his youth because he knew that they were not going to teach them the right thing, which is why we have a lot of what we have now out here. A lot of these shine bones, a lot of these young coons, a lot of these ignorant Black folks who know nothing about themselves or their culture, 
even if they're college educated, even if they have a good job and make money. The reason why is because the Department of Education. OK, when you have your enemy teach you and educate you, it can't be well. Sonny Carson knew that anyway. Now. Sonny Carson continued to do his thing. He was still no stranger to the media. He would appear in front of cameras at any time. Again, they were very attracted to him. Uh, they wanted to ask him questions. They wanted to hear him speak. One time, Sonny Carson showed up to the state assembly in Albany, New York, which is the capital, and set the drapes on fire. People, can you imagine that? They set the drapes in the highway on fire. This is a black man, Sonny Carson, going to the state house in New York. Imagine that in your state, wherever you live. And they just set all the drapes on fire in the hallway because they need to get their point across. That's what Sonny Carson was doing. Another epic Sonny Carson war. Now, in July of the year of 1976, Sonny Carson, he was invited to lecture at Yale. OK, he was invited to lecture at Yale. Why was Sonny Carson invited to Yale to lecture? Because he was very well respected. And these academics, Ivy League school, they knew that he was a black man. When he spoke, you need to listen. This is why somebody like Sonny Carson would be invited to lecture at Yale, who was all black, pro-black, for black, and he was a separatist. Yeah, they want to they wanna hear him speak, okay? Now, at the time, that the day that he was at Yale lecturing, okay, the police went to his house to arrest him for a murder. So you might think, okay, damn, he's getting arrested for a murder. Let's talk a little bit more about this murder that they went to his house to arrest him for while he's at Yale speaking, okay? The year is 1976. What happened was the organization, the Committee to Honor Black Heroes, again, you know they had a building in Brooklyn. They used the basement area, the downstairs area as their headquarters. Now, at this place, they had money. They had a lot of rare African artifacts and things like that. What happened was some of this money and some of these rare African artifacts were stolen. When they were stolen, Sonny Carson and his crew knew who did this immediately. They knew who stole this stuff. They didn't call the police. They had their own justice system. Sonny Carson and eight of his men armed with guns. They went to the house in Brooklyn of one of these dudes that they think stole this stuff. Well, they knew stole this stuff. Boom, boom. They laid him out, pushed him. He's gone. This is what kind of justice system he, he lived by. He's gone. They went and found the other person who was involved in his theft. Did the same thing to him, but he survived. They left him stretched out there, you know, dead in Long Island, by the way. They went to Long Island. This, this one didn't happen in Brooklyn, but this is why he was arrested. One murder, one attempted murder. And people, as much as we regret it, as much as our people don't like to admit it due to some of the um, relations and emotional connections we have to terrorists in our own communities or thugs who look like us, this is the only way that this can be fixed. OK. We have to take some of our own people out and that's just the way it is. And, and Sonny Carson, as much as he loved his people, that's what he did. And that's what kind of justice system he had. OK, so this is why he was arrested where he was speaking. Um, so he has to face the music for these murders. And we're going to get into the outcome of that a little later on. OK, we're going to get into the outcome of. These, these murder charges and this attempt murder that he's facing. But in the meantime, watch this video. Right around the corner from my mom's crib, I'm going to the store for my mother. On the way around the corner, there used to be a liquor store, right? And a drug, right next to the drug store. And my best friend, E Unique, his little brother was about 16. He worked in a drug store. So uh, I'm walking by and I'm, I look at him and the look on his face, I did not like, right? So I said, why you got that look on your face? What's going on? He was like, oh, my mom is mad at me, man. He was like, oh, um, my, my dad gonna get me when I, when I leave work tonight and go home. I'm trying to figure out what to say. I said, why your mother mad at you? He was like, man, I've been skipping school, going to see this girl, and I ain't been to school in two weeks, and they sent a letter home so she know. I cursed him out. He's my best friend's little brother. He respects me as his big brother. I'm reinforcing for him to go to school like his mother and father said. And I told him, if I see you with that look on your face, or I see you during school time, you ain't in school, I'm a f 
you up. Don't, I'm going to mess you up. Edit that out. Don't be putting my curses on the internet. <laughs> right? So I told him straight up. If I see you, I'm going I'm to I'm f*** you up. Right? <laughs> so, so the lady, the old lady whose her son owns the liquor store, she comes running out the liquor store. Who's that outside my store with that foul mouth? I don't even look at her. I just keep talking to my dude. She's like, you. I'm talking to you. I'm like, lady, do me a favor. Mind your f***ing business. <laughs> I'm dealing with him. You understand what I'm saying? I'm dealing with him, and it's none of your business. Just go back in your store and mind your business. She starts. Yeah, 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 yeah. So once again, I say, yo, mind your business. Go back in your store and mind your business. This ain't got nothing to do with you. I hear somebody from across the street say, hey, shut up. I turn around and look, and it's a police car that has stopped the guy that had ran a red light and was running his plates. He's looking across the street. He don't know what my conversation with her is. I'm like, you talking to me? You talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Shut up. I said, you shut the f*** up. <laughs> what are you talking to? You don't even know what you're talking about. So he comes across the street. I got this big old radio, like Radio Raheem. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, I told you to shut up. I was like, I don't care what you say. You ain't my father. But since when do the police go around telling people to shut up? What, what law is that if I don't shut up? He was like, put your hand behind your back. I was like, why? Because you're under arrest. For what? <laughs> disturbing the peace. I was minding my own business. So she came out of the store disturbing the peace. Not me. Right? He turns his back to me and asks her what happened.
because they didn't want it with Sonny Carson because they know one phone call, 50,000 black men in front of the precinct. Okay, a big shout out to a channel called Willie James for that right there. It was uploaded about nine years ago, but big up to him for trying to, you know, get some of this rare footage for people who actually knew Sonny Carson to uh, speak about it. Now, so people, as I said before, right, Sonny Carson was dealing with a murder and an attempt. Remember, he was dealing with that, okay? Now, while he he's dealing with those charges, his life was about to change forever. Now, Sonny Carson was a very talented brother, and he had written a book about his gangland youth. And this book that he wrote was picked up by Paramount Pictures, and he was planning to make a movie out of it. And this movie is what we know as The Education of Sonny Carson. Classic movie. If you haven't seen it yet, go see it. Now, during this time, this movie is picked up, and of course, he's out promoting the movie. Uh... He's doing what he needs to do for Paramount. You know, he has to do promotion. And he's also being called in for this murder and this attempt of these two men. But people say that when Sonny Carson didn't seem to be bothered or care at all. OK, he did not care. They said he was still just doing his movie promotion, going around, doing his thing. He could be seen out in the streets consulting with Paramount Pictures. He's riding around in a limousine. He did not have a care in the world. It seemed like he wasn't bothered by the fact that he was going in for trial. OK, now, again, one of the men that he that stole these things, one of the men, they thought they took him out of here, but he survived. So, of course, he's talking, he's telling, he's saying what he needs to say, OK, to try to get Sonny Carson and his men convicted for this. OK, now, again, Sonny Carson, he's doing a publicity tour. He goes all across America. Uh, but at the meantime, when he's doing his tour, he's also discussing black politi politics and the religion of white supremacy in America. Uh, one day, Sonny Carson was at the Beverly Wiltshire Hotel in Los Angeles, and a reporter seen him and came to him and wanted to talk and interview him. And the reporter said to Sonny Carson, you look as if you've been here all your life. But that's how Sonny Carson was. He was built for any situation. He could be a movie star under the bright lights. He could be a politician. He could speak at any university in America. He's a freedom fighter. He can be an activist. He could put his hands and pistols on you because he just could do everything. That was Sonny Carson. He could, you can't, he was not one of those people that you can just, he can just go somewhere and somebody could uh, dominate him in a conversation or in life experiences, okay? Again, he's here at the Beverly Wiltshire Hotel laying out chilling. The guy says, you look like you've been here all your life. Now, he's still dealing with the trial for these murders, and again, it didn't seem to phase him. They said that Sonny Carson would show up for trial sometimes in a bathrobe and slippers. He wasn't beat, you know? And uh, when he was at trial, when he was going through trial, he told the people, he told the courts, that him and his men had only been implementing justice. And Sonny Carson said because he's black, he couldn't rely on the white police and he only intended to make a citizen's arrest. He also said that there wouldn't even be a trial if he wasn't a famous militant. Now, in this situation right here, while Sonny Carson is going to trial, remember, they have the one guy who survived. In addition, one of his trigger men, one of the men that was with Sonny Carson, decided to turn on him. And that's what he did. But neither one of these men were credible witnesses. You got to figure they can't be because of their background. OK, outcome. Sonny Carson was acquitted of murder, but he ended up save, serving 17 months in prison for kidnapping. On the day of his murder trial acquittal, he stood up in court in front of the people who were applauding him. And he said, I'm just happy for everyone, especially for the people in the community. It's more a victory for them than for us. OK. Sonny Carson, he was well-loved and respected by his people, and that's just the type of person he was. Another epic war. Sonny Carson also went to war with Mayor David Dinkins and the New York City Police Department. Now, let's first get into who this guy David Dinkins is. David Dinkins was the first black mayor of New York, and of course he was a typical Democrat, you know, a black Democrat, a sock puppet for white supremacist liberals, that's what he was. That was his position. Pretty much like the ones we know of now. This is how they make their money. 
just like the current uh, New York mayor, uh, what's his name, Eric Adams, same thing, you know, sellout type Negroes who are just there to do what they are told to do. Now, in the year of 1989, David Dinkins was running for mayor of New York. Now, you know, a lot of times when these people run for mayor, they want all this harmony. They don't want any, they don't want to ruffle any feathers. They want everything to appear great. But at this time, it wasn't like that. There was a lot of racial tension in New York City. Now, I did a story on a previous channel about Yusuf Hawkins, who was killed by a bunch of racist youths and uh, Benz and Hurts, okay? So there was a lot going on at the time that David Dinkins was trying to become mayor uh, after this happened to Yusuf Hawkins. So what happened was Sonny Carson, he decided that they were going to do something about this. They were going to protest. They were going to do whatever as a result of what happened to Yusuf Hawkins. So he gathered a group of disciplined demonstrators, 7,500 of them, 7,500 demonstrators marching six rows across. They had placards and they were chanting, whose streets, our streets, what's coming, war. Now their goal is Sonny Carson and his crew of 7,500 demonstrators, they were going to go down to the Brooklyn Bridge and they were going to block traffic. They're going to shut it down. They're going to shut it all down. So when they finally got down there, they were met with heavily armed police guards, NYPD, heavily armed. So when they got there, they met the police. They squared off. Sonny Carson breached the police barrier and they got into a 20 minute all out brawl battle with the police. They say that 44 cops and some protesters were severely or seriously injured. So that's something that Sonny Carson breached the police barrier. He was all about it, man. He wasn't just going to, you know, sit back and send his soldiers out there and say things like, you know, this or else. Now, nah, he was going to be down there throwing blows with him. That's why people respected Sonny Carson. So when Sonny Carson and his people did this, this put a real, real big tarnish on David, David Dinkins candidacy. Remember, he needed all this racial harmony in New York. He needed the whole kumbaya thing. He's running for mayor. Things have to appear to be so great. We don't have racism. Everything is good. Please don't talk about this now type stuff. Now, David Dinkins didn't get his wish because after this standoff with the police and Sonny Carson and his crew, it caused more racial division in the city. It wasn't a good look for David Dinkins' campaign. So what David Dinkins did and his people, they decided we got to do something about this. So what they did is they pretty much paid Sonny Carson $9,500 to get the vote out into his neighborhood of Bedford Stuyvesant. Basically, I want to hire you to work with my campaign. Here's this. Can you take this and, you know, try to help us get the vote? We need these votes, Sonny Carson. I know you got a lot of influence. Sonny Carson took the money. Okay. And many people say that this was simply a payoff or insurance money for Sonny Carson just to stay calm and do nothing which we know that's what it was. We know that's what it was. So it was like, okay, we're paying this money to Sonny Carson's organization uh, or whatever. So Sonny Carson took the money and within days, people from David Dinkins' crew, well, not his crew, the media, they found out that Sonny Carson's campaign organization was nothing but a shell. It didn't have an address. It didn't have a telephone number or member. So they're saying, well, David Dinkins, you paid Sonny Carson's campaign organization $9,500. It doesn't exist. David Dinkins did make a big mistake because Sonny Carson didn't respect David Dinkins. Yeah, he took the money. There were all kind of, you know, newspaper articles and stories coming out saying that David Dinkins paid off Sonny Carson, you know, on some scandal type stuff type stuff. And Sonny Carson didn't even care. After he got the money, he called a press conference. And he made his remarks again about being anti-white. He didn't care. They thought that they could pay off Sonny Carson and Sonny Carson would just keep quiet. But, you know, people like Sonny Carson don't respect people like David Dinkins. And I have to agree. He said, OK, I'll take that money. He took the money and still did what he wanted to do. Now, after David Dinkins became the mayor, he did win. In 1990, there was some more stuff going on with Sonny Carson and the people in Brooklyn. OK, now, 
the black community in Brooklyn had a beef. They had a problem with two Korean grocery stores called the Red Apple Grocery in the Flatbush section. OK, now this Red Apple Grocery store is all over, by the way. I, I've seen them. I mean, they're in like Washington State everywhere. They're a big deal now. But Red Apple Grocery Store. Now, you know that there's always going to be beef between any type of Asian or Korean or whatever grocery stores in black neighborhoods simply because they don't respect our humanity. They just want our money. And when you come in with that, it's going to be a problem. Anyway, people know that. They know when these things are like that. So th something went on in the stores where they abused a woman. And Sonny Carson, he called for a boycott of these stores. OK, so for months, Sonny Carson and his people and protesters, they blocked the stores. They told black people not to shop with people who don't look like them. They didn't allow their people to go in there. They really were on the verge of shutting these stores down. Like, listen, don't go there. David Dinkins, being a shine bone, buck dancing, bellhop coon that he is, he spoke out against the boycotts that the black people were doing in a speech publicly. He spoke out against the black people and he took it a step even further. He even went down to one of these Red Apple grocery stores to show people, you know, that he was against the protest. He went inside and purchased a carton of milk and walked out just to do it, just to show. So this, day, this guy, David Dinkins, that will show you more about the type of person that he is. But what could we expect? He's the mayor of New York. OK. There's so much more to this brother, Sonny Carson, man. It, it We could go on and on. And a lot of people don't talk about Sonny Carson. A lot of people don't know about Sonny Carson. But there's so many more stories, man. I mean, this was a real warrior for the people. He was a man who was respected by the white community and loved and respected by his own people. I mean, they, he's, he's what they call a flamethrower. He said what he wanted to say, and he actually did it. Many people don't agree with his tactics, but anybody who calls himself an American or a patriot, and they say that they don't agree with Sonny Carson's tactics, they are a hypocrite, and they pretty much have a problem with black people doing things that white people do in order to get justice, okay? This is as American as it gets, a protest, doing things with violence. This is what Sonny Carson did, and he knew that. He knew that from a young age. You know what I'm saying? And that's just how it was. People who have a problem with how Sonny Carson went about things are clearly hypocrites. I mean, this is a black man who used the tactics that he knew about that were effective in his history. You know what I'm saying? That's just the way it is. But you got to understand, you know, the white community has such a deep rooted fear of black people that when a black man like Sonny Carson does this one man, it could shake up the entire country. And people like Sonny Carson are actually the reason why the government, the media and big white corporations are so vested in keeping black people high on drugs, stupid and worshiping celebrities in prison, ignorant, not knowing about their history, not knowing anything. These are the reasons why these things are there. These are the reasons why the Department of Education makes sure that black students that they teach remain ignorant because of people like Sonny Carson. And he was only one man. Look at what one man did. One man who the people respected did. Could you imagine if there were 10 Sonny Carsons at one time or maybe even 20? They know this. This is scary to them. This is scary to them. This is why they are so vested and manufacturing Negro, Negro bots, coons, sellouts, celebrity worshipers, people who don't know anything and making sure that the youth don't know anything about their culture or their history. People like Sonny Carson and others really concern them. One man, y'all. One man. Could you imagine if it were just 10? Suppose it was 20 like him. It's so much more to this brother, Sonny Carson. If you know more about him, if you're related to Sonny Carson, Get down in the comments or if you're just somebody who knows about Sonny Carson, leave us some comments. I mean, um, Sonny Carson, Abu Badika, Sonny Carson, he passed away in December of 2002. But let's give up to the warrior. Give a big up to the warrior. Abu Badika, Sonny Carson. Easy.